All right, well, as Rick mentioned, yes, I get to preach for the next seven weeks, which I'm excited about that. You know, a long time ago, some of you might know this and some of you might not, but back in the summer of 1991, Tina and I came to Chatham, and my first job in Chatham was as a school teacher in the school district, and I was a part-time guidance counselor. And well, you know, if you ask any teacher about right now, and you say, hey, what's your favorite part of teaching, what are they going to say? Yes, June, July, and August, that's right. And with spring break over, you know, we're getting towards that month of June that teachers love so much. And I bring that up this morning because today we're going to have a chance to be a teacher. Uh, We're going to have a chance to participate with teachers in a little in a small way by doing performing a task that they perform on a daily daily basis and before I get into what that task is we're going to set the stage with the scripture that we're going to be studying this morning because this morning we began our study of the seven churches found in Revelation chapters two and three I think the best thing is just to kind of read it get a nice overall view of it and then we'll dissect it for further study so let's go ahead and read Revelation chapter two one through seven this morning To the angel of the church in Ephesus write, the one who holds the seven stars in his right hand, the one who walks among the seven golden lampstands says this, I know your deeds and your toil and perseverance and that you cannot tolerate evil men and you put to the test these who call themselves apostles and they are not and you found them to be false And you have perseverance and have endured for my name's sake and have not grown weary. But I have this against you, that you've left your first love. Therefore, remember from where you have fallen and repent and do the deed you did at first. Or else I'm coming to you and will remove your lampstand out of its place unless you repent. Yet this you do have, that you hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will grant to eat of the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. Now, there's a lot going on in those seven short verses. So your teacherly duty this morning is to help me grade the church in Ephesus. Okay, so put on your teacher's hat. We're going to give Ephesus a report card. So are you ready? Let's go. First subject, hardworking. What kind of grade would you give the church in Ephesus for being hard workers. A, yes, I think we should give them an A. It's a hardworking church. Jesus just said, I know your works. I know your deeds, your toil. These guys know how to get it done. Good job, Ephesians. Next subject, endurance. What do you think we should give them for endurance? Hey, let's be generous. Let's give them another A. We're easy teachers. Jesus was sure to point out that the Ephesians persevered. Right? They endured. They had not grown weary. That's pretty good. Good job, Ephesians. How about teaching? Third category. What do you guys think? Another A. Yes, doctrine or teaching. Let's give them an A. Great. They did not tolerate false teachings in what we read. Jesus commended the church for this. Now, fourth and final subject. What about love? F. We're giving them an F. Epic fail. Because in the process of focusing on hard work, meaning that they had great, a lot of great ministries in Ephesus and patient endurance, meaning that life didn't cause them to waver in their faith and sound doctrine, they believed and taught which was truth. In spite of all that, they lost and they, they abandoned their first love for Jesus. Now, is our Lord okay with this? No. He's livid. He's angry. He's angry enough to hold them back over this one subject. So the main message this morning is this, is that it's crucial for us and thus the church to remain in love with Jesus. At the very core of what it means to be a Christian is to have a love for Christ that is alive and it's dynamic. And and we love him. Why? Because he's redeemed us. right? He's raised us up with him. We're forgiven in Christ. We're made alive together in Christ. We're seated with him. We're created with him. If you have Christ, you have everything, right? But if you you don't have Christ, you have nothing. And we know this. We know that Christianity is not a religion of do's and don'ts. It's not a religion of rules and rituals. It's a loving relationship with Christ. And As in other relationships, sometimes our passion for Christ explodes 
And other times, it's kind of mechanical, routine. And this is what's happened to the church in Ephesus. And they got the big, fat, failing grade on their report card for it. So with these seven letters, let's learn about the early church, but let's also examine our own lives to make sure we're not getting a failing grade in any subject. And, and we can look at our church as a whole and try to determine what kinds of things would Jesus say about our congregation here at Chatham Christian Church. And of course, we should always keep our eyes focused on Christ, on Jesus, grow in our knowledge of him, which then out of love kind of guides our behavior. So top of mind during this study is what can we learn about Jesus in this passage and in these letters to the seven churches? So that's our goal. But first, let's address the setting of Ephesus. Okay. So this is the first letter of the seven letters to churches in Revelation. Ephesus is, uh, is in modern-day Turkey. Um, it was a huge urban area, a thriving, thriving city. Uh, think of, like, New York, Los Angeles, Chicago. It's not just a little town down the road. It was culturally advanced in sports and theater and literature. Big, big urban area. And, uh, and the archaeological digs there are really quite amazing because they've uncovered so much that you really get a feel for what the city was like and how big it was. And with that expansion became an explosion in pagan religions, right? And one of the seven wonders of the ancient world was in Ephesus. And this was the temple to the false god, of course, Artemis or Diana. And literally, you can see the grandeur of that. The thousands of people would go to this temple of Diana every year. It was one of the seven wonders of the world located in Ephesus to whom this letter is addressed. Now, today, there's not much left. You can see the foundation of it, some stones and a few columns here and there. But it does give you a little bit of a feel of how big that temple was. Also in Ephesus, there's a huge theater. Now, this was a walkway from their port. Like if you got off a ship, you're going to this big urban area, you would walk down this main walkway, and you see the theater in the background. Now, let's show a close-up of that theater. It's huge. It would seat 25,000 people. Now, think Jacksonville, Illinois, right? 25,000 people could sit in this one theater. And, 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 and as you can see, it's just well preserved to this day. They still use it for a variety of functions. Well, it was in the middle of this massiveness, this bigness, that this, this, this huge pagan culture that God built a powerful, powerful, powerful church. Right? It was founded by Paul in 50 A.D. And later in life, when he was imprisoned in Rome around 62, Paul wrote a letter to these guys called what? Ephesians. It's a book in our Bible. So this is actually the second letter to the Ephesians we have in Scripture. And this time it's penned by the Apostle John. And it's written about 40 years after the church in Ephesus had been established. So at the time of this evaluation by Jesus himself, this church is just a little bit younger than Chatham Christian Church. And ever since this church in Ephesus was founded by Paul, they were discipled by Aquila. They were taught by Apollos. They were pastored by Timothy. And then as we have been learning, the Apostle John made Ephesus his headquarters for ministry. So that's not a bad team of leaders. We've had a good group of leadership over the years, but that's the A team for sure. This was a strong church, and it had a lot going for it, right? And as we'll see as we dig in a little bit deeper this morning. So that's the setting of Ephesus. Let's get into the letter a little bit. Ephesus, uh, in Revelation 2, 1 through 7. Now, go ahead and do the next slide, please. We just read this from, from 2 and 3. We just read this about their deeds and their toil and perseverance. So what can we learn about Jesus in this passage? Well, one thing we learned in verse 1 was he was the one who holds the seven stars, and he walked among the lampstands, referring back to, actually referring back to the first chapter of Revelation about verse 12 that Rick covered last week with this awesome description of Jesus. And it was the one that John just fell down on his face and just worshiped the glory of the risen Lord. And, and Jesus was walking among the lampstands. And that's a reminder that the church, whom we identified last week as being a lampstand, that the church is not the light, but we're called to be the lampstand and shine the light. And that's what we do here at Chatham Christian Church. We're called to be the lampstand for Jesus. We're called to shine his light into a dark world. And that picture of him walking amongst the lampstands, I mean, no one knows a church like Jesus. He knows what's going on. He's there walking, right? He's kind of monitoring the church. He's 
auditing, so to speak. He's doing, looking for strengths and weaknesses. He's involved with the life of the church. We're his bride. This is his church that he bought with his own blood. There's no secrets from him. He's here. He's on site. He's on location. He's here with us every Sunday morning, right? Is he not? We just sung a song about that. He's here with us every Sunday morning we come to worship. How does that impact how you're going to sing the next worship song? How does that impact your attitude as you walk into the doors on a Sunday morning? Knowing that the risen Lord is here amongst us right now, even as I'm speaking. I mean, that's exciting. We're not coming to to check a, uh, check a, a box on a Sunday morning checklist. We're not coming out of habit. We're here to be with and to worship Jesus. The risen Christ is always with us when we gather. This is his church, right? This is not Rick's church. This is not my church. This is not the elder's church. This is Christ's church, and we need to therefore behave accordingly. And this particular church, even though it's lacking in some very, a very important area, it had some strengths, right? In verses 2 and 3, we read nothing but positives, nothing but amens for this congregation. We gave them an A for being hard workers because, look, I know your deeds, plural. This was an active church, a dynamic church. The Ephesians were action-oriented, hardworking. They weren't stagnant. And out of love for Christ, we too need to be an active church. We need to be active in the Chatham community, right? Serving others, being compassionate towards others, because that's what our Lord was when a need or a person was presented to him. And toil, that word means that they, they worked to the point of exhaustion. They just didn't serve when it was convenient, right? These were like spiritual marines, the few, the proud, the Ephesians. They hit the beach and they got after it, right? They serving, giving, doing, going, deeds to the point of exhaustion. I mean, if you were a member of the Ephesian church, does that describe you? And perseverance, they overcame obstacles. They weren't quitters. Look, they couldn't tolerate evil men. They, there were already false teachers around. They identified them. And no, they focused on truth and on doctrine. We also gave them an A for that. This was an incredible church, right? It was a good church. The individuals in the church as a whole had many good things going for them. And remember, this was Jesus' estimation as he's walking amongst the church. And so the obvious application for us today is what? Is that if he were here walking amongst Chatham Christian Church, what would he say to us? What would our report card be? And if he were to, here to evaluate you in some of these things, what would he say about you? There's no doubt in my mind that there would be some very positive things that he would say about us as a body and about us, us as individuals, just like he commended the Ephesians. But in Ephesus, everything they were doing right was negated by the one thing they were doing wrong. Right? They wandered from the principle of keeping the main thing the main thing. So the next verse that we're going to look at starts with a little word, but. Now, sometimes that little word, but, is good in the Bible, and sometimes they're not, right? They're words of transition. For example, in this book of Ephesians, in chapter one, or for, uh, chapter 2 of Ephesians, verse 1, we learn that we are dead in our transgressions and in our sins. Then we get to verse 4, and we see that word of transition, but God, being rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us even when we were dead in our transgressions, made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved. In that case, that word of transition is a wonderful, wonderful word. We were spiritually dead, but God made us alive with Christ. In our passage today, it's not such a wonderful but. After all those positives, Jesus says, but I have this against you. And I bet as the congregation in Ephesus is listening to the pastor read this letter, I bet they swallowed pretty hard at this point. Because the pastor read, but I have this against you that you left your first love. Now, this didn't happen overnight. This most likely didn't happen overnight. It's kind of like a slow leak in a tire, 
right? It happens over a period of time. If it happened quickly, then they probably would have noticed it. Wow, we just blew out a tire. But losing your first love kind of slowly happens. And amidst all those positives, their ministry, their stance on truth, right, their, their love for Jesus, it just grew cold. And that's what Jesus said. They weren't keeping the main thing the main thing. So what is first love? Guys, do you remember the first love? Guys, you remember it. When we opened every door for our loved one, right? When we routinely bought them flowers and gifts just as expressions of our love. And now sometimes on their birthday, they, we don't even get them a gift. Or at least we don't put much thought into it sometimes. First love. When I would gladly dance with Tina at weddings because she enjoyed dancing at weddings. Now... She has to drag me out kicking and screaming to dance with her at weddings or another place. First love. I mean, we can all remember back to how we behaved, those feelings we had at that time. But that initial passion sometimes or due to life, it just seems to fade. And that's what happened here in Ephesus. They had a first love for Christ, but something happened along the way. Now, notice Christ is faithful. What's he doing? He's walking amongst the church. He hasn't gone anywhere. It was their devotion to him that cooled off. Their attendance was becoming mechanical. Their relationship with Christ was routine, worship, cold, rehearsed. They were coming to church, but their hearts weren't in it. Can we relate? Remember, we need to look at these letters and apply this to our lives. Is this describing us? Is this describing our church? And at some point... If we're all honest with ourselves, I know we can relate to this passage. Because we're flesh, we're fleshly creatures. And as much as we try to walk in the spirit, sometimes, oftentimes, we fail. We become busy, preoccupied with life, and the priority of Christ versus the world, sometimes it just gets mixed up in our hearts and our minds. Well, if this does describe your current state right now in life, if maybe this morning more than ever you realize just like these Ephesians, wow, maybe I've lost my first love I had with the Lord. You know, how would someone turn that around? How would someone get back on track? And the one thing we learn about Jesus and God in this passage is that they're nothing but truth. And they're nothing but love. And they only want what's best for us. Like, they will never play games. They will never be vague. Right? God will never beat around the bush. He's clear, and so Christ is clear. He says to us in the following verse, in essence, yes, you can rekindle that first love, and he's going to tell us how. But if you choose not to, then I don't know if I'd bother doing much of anything else. Because if we think the risen Lord and Savior is okay with being worshipped by people who don't love him, then I think we better think again. Because he gives them this instruction. Remember Therefore, remember from where you have fallen and repent and do the deeds you did at first or else I'm coming to you and I will remove that lampstand. I will remove your lampstand out of its place unless you repent. Now, I really love the simplicity and the brilliance of the instruction that Jesus gives here to those believers, to us, to any believer over any generation. In one verse, he lays out a three-step process of how to rekindle that love. And he said first, in verse 5, to remember. Therefore, remember. Remember what it was like when you had that first love. Remember how exciting it was, how excited you were, how contagious that first love is. You're filled with excitement. Now, why? Because Jesus just washed your sins away. You were dead, and now you're alive in Christ. You know you had that first love, and you were excited about that. For me, I think this really hit me in college. I mean, I was on my own, studying on my own, and God just touched my heart. And I was just in the scripture more than ever, and I just had that extreme first love for Christ. I, I didn't know what to do. I found some TV preachers, and they were okay. And they became a little suspect over time, but <laughs> at the time... At the time, at the time, they fed me. God used them at that time. They fed me. He was, I was growing. He, God was on my mind all the time. And that's what he's saying. Your life is in high gear for God, and you're just not even considering touching that break. Everything 
in one way or another just kind of reverts, revolves around God. What was it like in your life? We all have different situations, guys. We all have different circumstances, but we all had a first love for Jesus. So he says, you need to remember that. Remember from where you've been fallen, from where you've fallen. And then step two in that verse, Jesus calls us to repent. And if this describes you this morning, repent. Admit we've been wrong. Sincerely ask for forgiveness, and we know that God we know as we study him every Sunday morning and every day, we know God, he's immutable, he can't mutate, he cannot change. He tells us he's just, he's kind, he's faithful to forgive our sins when we repent. But I tell you, if you plan to repent, to tell God you're sorry while you're in the middle of a sin or while you're on your way to doing that sin, again, I say, don't even bother because that's not repentance. Repentance. The forgiveness we find through grace and the repentance process is not a license to sin. Repentance is more than saying, sorry, God, and you keep on doing it. Repentance is saying no more. You stop the car dead in your tracks, and you go back and you honor your first love like you know you should be doing. So if you've gotten off track and you've lost your first love that you had for our Savior, he just says, repent change course, and he will forgive us. And as we're getting back on track, Jesus says, step three, repeat. Repeat the deeds you did at the beginning. Baseball fans, go back to spring training. Football fans, go back to the opening series of plays. Pickleball players, go back to zero, (laughs) serving zero, two, right? Go back to the beginning. What are those deeds you did at the beginning? The text doesn't say, but other passages in the Bible do give us some examples. And the best one, I think, is Acts chapter 2, verses 41 through 42. So let's look at them now. We read this. So then, those who had received his word, you know, the beginning of their walk, were baptized. And that day, there were added about 3,000 souls. They were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching. They They were devoting themselves to fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. That's it. Right there. Christianity. 101. That's why here at CCC, there are some things that are very negotiable when we get our time together, but things that are not negotiable are those four things. We will be in the Word of God on Sunday morning. We'll be in the Scriptures. We will have fellowship, Sunday school classes, other means of fellowship. We will have prayer, and we will have communion. Those are the essentials. We never outgrow that. So when you first became a Christian, it was probably very similar. When you first fell in love with Christ, you couldn't get enough of the Word. You wanted to learn more and more and more and more and more about God. And then we could never outgrow that. We can always, always keep learning. And fellowship. You probably found a little group that you talked with all the time about Christ. Because that's what they mean here about fellowship. It's more than just a fellowship hall or donuts. And, and you know I like donuts, right? I'm, I put on some 10 pounds of Edwana donuts. But, but uh, donuts are fine, but that's not the fellowship they're talking about. They're talking about talking about Christ, and and we're in the Word learning about Christ, and we're praying to Christ. And in communion, we're looking to Christ. He's primary in everything. That's how you get back in the game. You do the deeds you did at first. So before we get to our conclusion, we should finish off verse 5, where Jesus says this, or else I'm coming to you and will remove your lampstand out of its place unless you repent. Now that, folks, is not the second coming of Christ that we look forward to. That's a divine intervention to shut an operation down. I mean, in spite of all those good things they're doing right, in spite of their hard work, endurance, patient endurance, sound doctrine, Jesus says, I will close that church down. He does not want to be worshipped by people who don't love him. So if this does describe a state where you find yourself this morning, repent. Remember, repent, and repeat, as he's told us to do. Well, finishing off this first letter to the letter of the church in in, in Ephesus, let's read the promise that Jesus often concludes these letters with. We read in verse 6. 
Yet this you do have, that you hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will grant to eat of the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. Gracious, gracious is our Lord. Kind of lets up on him here at the end. He knows we're weak at times when it comes to spiritual things. We've all been there, and we've all strayed at some point, one time or another. So he's gracious. And he says, basically, just keep walking, keep remaining in me. You hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans. I also hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans. Now, feel free to look those up on your own time. The bottom line is it's probably a teaching of grace gone too far, a license to sin. They were teaching that there's, you have a freedom to sin, and we know that that is wrong, totally contrary to Scripture. But to those who overcome, Christ says, in all these letters that we'll look at over the next seven weeks, to those who overcome that distraction and others, he gives us wonderful promises. And remember, the original readers of this letter were under extreme persecution. So he says, overcome that. I've got a promise for you. And for us, we're distracted in so many ways. He says, overcome. And, for, and, and he says, he will grant to us to eat of the tree of life. The tree of life. Where the first Adam sinned and was cut off, from the, uh, thrown out of the garden, cutting humanity off from the tree of life. Where the second Adam, Jesus, who had no sin, reconciles us back to the Father, grants us citizenship in heaven. And that is an assurance we have in Scripture that this, when the one who walks among the churches is Lord and Savior of your life, your sins are forgiven in him, through him, and you'll be able to eat of the tree of life when perfection is restored. And that will happen when Christ comes again and returns and makes everything anew and restores it back to perfection. So in conclusion... Let's just ask each other this. What have we learned about Jesus in the first of these seven letters to the churches in Revelation? What have you learned about Jesus this morning? Well, I think we can conclude that he's very serious about the love you have for him. And he's very serious about the love that the church has for him as the bride of Christ. For he is our groom. Have you left your first love? What does your, what does our church's report card look like? If, if we've identified a few A's, I say, let's make them A pluses, right? He's worth it. He's the king of kings, the lord of lord. He's the alpha and the omega. He's worthy of an A plus. If you or if we have a body, if we have a failing grade, I pray that Jesus opens our eyes. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. That our Lord would move us to remember, repent, and repeat. Jesus is full of grace, as outlined in those three steps. And, and this is no way intended to be put any of us on a guilt trip. I mean, every one of us in this room, we're on a trip and filled with nothing but grace. And it's exactly that grace that should have us running back to him. So in a few moments, we're going to be eating the Lord's Supper together. And one of the purposes of the Lord's Supper is to examine ourselves. And so if this first letter has touched your heart in any way, just turn it over to Christ. Turn it over to him now and just be refreshed in his overwhelming forgiveness and his overwhelming love and his overwhelming grace. So let's begin to get ready for communion right now as we stand and sing, Revive Us Again. And that's, that's found in the page 434 of your hymnal. Of course, the words will be on the screen. Revive us again. <laughs>